I'm very uh, lucky today to have with me one of uh, my, the one one profound community supporters of Habib University from the Dhanani family who uh, just a couple of years ago uh, gave an extraordinary donation to Habib University and uh, supported this cause of higher education that that we have. And we were also lucky that through the Dhanani family, we were able to connect with some uh, extraordinary business uh, folks within the within the family who were taking care of some um, some very large scale businesses. And when we were thinking about understanding the impact of COVID, we couldn't think of anyone else to start with. So I'm really glad to have uh, one of the Dhananis with us today, Usman Dhanani. Um, hello and welcome, Usman. I hope you're doing well. Hi, how are you guys? Yeah, we're doing well over here. Just trying to adjust to this uh, new COVID lifestyle. How about you guys? Well, we can be as good as uh, as we can get. Uh, Pakistan is not as badly struck with this, or at least we don't see the impacts as much as we see in the United States. So I can imagine things are pretty bad. So the viewers who are uh, joining us um, and are probably going to see you for the first time, can you share a brief introduction about yourself? What you do? What's your what's your role in the family? And, and what is it that you're taking after? Yeah, absolutely. So I'm Osman Danani. Uh, my father, Shokat, uh, has been very involved with uh, Habib University. So I, I like to say that I formally joined the, the family business about um, three years ago when I completed my uh, master's in uh, entrepreneurship. I finished it in 2016 and 2017. I formally joined the business, but I like to say that informally I've worked in the business all my life. Uh, because, you know, being a family business, uh, it, the, the business discussions blend over from, uh, you know, the conference room to the dinner table, right? It's always something discussing and always being passionate in business. I've always asked questions, wanted to tag along for different meetings and things of that sort. So um, I primarily uh, handle, we've got a, a brand of six uh, casual dining Tex-Mex restaurants in, in, based in Houston called Cyclone Anaya's. So I was um, lucky enough to be tasked with that responsibility when I graduated from my master's to say, okay, hey, we're going through, we're going to diversify our portfolio from primarily quick service to a little bit of casual dining. So why don't you spend some time there and um, really deep dive into it and understand the differences between casual dining and quick service to see, okay, is this a business that we want to continue to grow in? I see. So I just picked up two things, the kind of business that you are involved in and Houston. So Usman, tell us how things have been in Houston. Um, mm -hmm. I, we don't hear some very pleasant things, but you, you, of course, are right there. What's happening in Houston? What's the situation like right now? So, you know, thankfully, I would say now in Houston, the, the number of positive cases has decreased week over week. But we just recently experienced a large spike after um, uh, the sort of restart of the city and the, the economy in Texas. Um, there were a few um, things that kind of happened in the state of Texas, whether it be long weekends or protests or whatever anybody wants to credit the rise in spike, uh, cases to. But some things have happened. And so we had a huge spike where... Um, they kind of had to roll back the restarting of the economy here. So uh, to put it in perspective, during the whole um, lockdown quarantine in Houston, we um, all restaurants went to, to go only for a period of time, meaning quick service to casual dining, fine dining, everything was to go only. So that was a huge adaptation that a lot of restaurants had to underdo, under, overtake. And then as uh, they started to roll back uh, these measures and start increasing the, the restart of the economy, they slowly moved the, the dine in. They said, okay, well now you can dine in, but you can only do it at 25% capacity of what your general usual capacity is. And in addition, all tables need to be six feet apart from each other to kind of keep the social distance uh, and, uh, and a few other regulations as well. So we continuously did that 25% to 50%. We got up to 75%, but at that point, 
they started to see a rise in cases. So they started to roll it back. And now we're, 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 we're still at 50% dine-in capacity. I see. You actually touched upon the first point. I wanted to understand how the, how the food industry was impacted, especially during COVID. And, and you did mention that you had to all of a sudden adapt to a very different set of requirements. Usman, if we think about when this all was happening, uh, end of Feb, early March, and at the beginning, uh, a lot of people were not really sure if this is actually what's happening, um, if this is just another rumor. And um, so a lot of planning at that time that, that was happening was based on huge uncertainty. So if I was to ask, if you, if you were to think about the time back in March when things were extremely uncertain, what was it that you were thinking at that time? Were you making short-term plans or were you thinking... Um, of a longer term plan, what's happening at the business end of things? How are, how are you imagining? So, you know, uh, short term, obviously, like you said, that this was something that came out of nowhere and everyone was kind of uncertain about uh, the details or conditions or the understanding of the entire virus. So what was happening was that we had a few decisions to make as far as, um, you know, the number one priority for us is we want to make sure that we keep all of our team members safe and in safe positions. So, um, that was, you know, before it, things were kind of mandated, we were already taking uh, measures to make sure that everybody was safe as far as providing masks, gloves, and different things that um, trying to balance the other spectrum of it, that we are a business. So we've got to figure out how we can adapt or navigate this business to make sure that we, we're ensuring um, the survival of the business. So at the time, you know, we, for quick service, what kind of happened was 70% of our business in quick service is, is, is drive through already. So we shut down the dining room. So that's 30% of your business that is gone. So now we have to adapt and say, how are we going to make sure to funnel that business into the drive through So what we kind of saw as that went on was that because for initially consumers were just kind of staying home because again, there was so much uncertainty, but after, you know, about a week or 10 days, people want to get out of the house for some reason, which means, okay, that means let's go pick up food from our local fast food restaurant and just go through the drive through And at least that's some sort of outing. So what we started to see was people were getting, as people were getting more familiar with it, they were going through the drive through our get, And what we tried to do was we tried to make sure the guest was as safe or felt as safe as they could going through our drive through So we made sure to show that we were following proper guidelines. We were, everybody in the restaurant was wearing masks and gloves. We were sanitizing common touch bases as much as we could to let the guests know that, Hey, we want you to feel as safe as you can be here. And we wanted to make sure our team members know that, Hey, coming to work is also safe because we're going to do whatever we can to keep you guys safe. And the same thing went for our casual dining restaurants. We had to quickly adapt where we did 90% of our business in dining capacity and only less than 10% to go, where 100% of our business was now going through to go and zero was a diamond. So at the same time, we you know provided everybody with the, the correct PPP, PPE, and we made sure to put uh, proper procedures in place to make sure everything was kind of being sanitized. And we offered so many different um, uh, options to our guests who wanted to come pick up food where they did not even have to step inside the restaurant if they did not feel comfortable. We would take their payment over the phone. We would, as soon as they would get there, they would give us a call. We would bring somebody out, gloves, masks, everything, and we would hand them their food and that was it. So they lim very much limited their interaction with us. Very interesting to hear. Osman, I was just thinking of another question. Um, so food industry, I think is very unique in the sense that um, there is a constant supply of ingredients. And in many cases, those ingredients have to be fresh. So you can't stock mm -hmm. them for a very long period of time. When the customers are known, when you know that the flow is going to be 500 customers a day, 400 customers a day, based on these patterns, you can predict what sort of raw material you need and when to order the next one. And now I'm imagining that some things are changing or changed at that particular time. Probably some supply lines were impacted, either because the farmers, the fresh folks weren't bringing in, and probably some, some impact was happening on the chain. Second, as you were adjusting, and as people were adjusting, the number of people who chose to come to restaurants was all of a sudden became an unknown number, became a question mark. 
So I'm just trying to imagine how would you in an industry manage this? And, and you're playing with two things. You don't want to say goodbye to a customer because you don't have food. And you also don't want to waste uh, extra resources by buying something. And of course, you don't want to sell those poor resources later on. So it seems like a very tricky situation. Yeah. So, it, you know, as far as like the supply chain went, um, there were a few items that uh, we ended up not being able to have in the restaurant to sell for just a short period of time as we kind of adjusted and the supply chain sort of adjusted to it as well. But we were also in a very fortunate position that um, our brands in Houston or, you know, throughout our, throughout the United States is that we've got um, a good concentration of restaurants in each, um, each city that we do business in. So we were, we were lucky in the sense that if one restaurant were to, you know, run short of something or, um, because of inaccurate forecasting due to the changes in times, well, guess what? There's another restaurant 10 to 15 minutes nearby that you can go borrow some supplies from and bring it back and kind of work it out there. So we are fortunate in that sense that we, we do have a good concentration where we can kind of navigate through that. But you are absolutely correct. So in the restaurant industry, a lot of what we do as far as forecasting and management is we look at you know, the, um, the same week or the same month last year. And we say, okay, hey, this week we did about this much in sales. So that kind of forecast, we'll need this much in labor. This is how much food we'll need and things like that. But now you're, you know, we're not, we're not forecasting over last year anymore. So what we really had to navigate and change is it's a day by day, week by week thing. So we would look at it and say, okay, well, uh, you know, today's Wednesday. And you say, okay, today's Wednesday. So we have to look at how did our sales do last Wednesday, last week during the whole coronavirus pandemic? And you say, okay, well, this was a sale. So this was it. But then you also look at it and say, well, Monday and Tuesday of this week were higher sales than last week. So we do have to kind of navigate and say, okay, well, maybe we should increase it a little bit more. And at the same time, you know, there are spikes in cases and there's falls in cases. So sometimes it would be like, well, today's Wednesday and we look at Monday and Tuesday and guess what? We did half as many sales as we did last week because there's been a spike in cases. So now we've got to, we've got to just do the best we can and kind of forecast and say, okay, well, we're going to go light on this order because we think that the, because of the number of cases, we're not going to have the sales. So it was, it was um, a little bit of making the best educated guess you could. So based on this experience, I'm wondering if you guys have a good statistician and a good data visualization support on board. Well, we do, you know, we are, you know, in the restaurant industry, there's different programs that do help you with this, but you know, ultimately you can only, re that's only as good as the people that are doing it. So we're very fortunate that we've got a, a, a very seasoned team in place and we've got really great people who we treat as family because we're as a family business. So they treat the business as their own business because they feel like they're a part of the family as well. So um, all the credit goes to the great team that we have in place to, to handle all this. So what was happening at your end to understand what, what is it that the user is going through? One thing is for you to predict, mm -hmm. but um, was there some way to understand from the user's perspective what they are going through so that you can make some adjustments that are more in line with the customer needs? Yeah. So, you know, there was a few good examples of that as, you know, um, as far as like our casual dining went, um, we tried to make the experience as seamless or as comfortable as possible for the guests. And so our perception was we want to limit the interaction that they have in the restaurant or with anybody just to make them feel very safe. But what we started to see was when we would, when guests would call in and place it to go order, we would ask them, would you like us to run the food out to your car so you don't have to come inside? And in fact, some of them would say, no, I'm fine with coming inside. And so after speaking with the team a little bit, what we started to learn was that, again, people are at home, people are staying with their family. So what they enjoyed was coming into the restaurant to pick up the food because now they got to have this interaction with someone that made it seem somewhat like a somewhat normal experience when they usually pick up food. They wanted to come inside and say, hey, how are you guys doing? How's business? How are things going? So they would, you know, generally when they would come in when during normal times, just pick up their food and leave. Now we saw them coming in and they would have a five to seven minute conversation with whoever was assisting them, just talking about business, talking about this, talk, and they just wanted some sense of normalcy. So that was one thing that we started to see. 
The other thing we started to remember was that we wanted to do everything that we could to make the guest as comfortable coming to the restaurant their, on their first visit to us to hopefully build that, build that experience up so they would feel more comfortable coming back. Because we felt that if a, if a guest were to come to our restaurant and for whatever reason they found something that they did not feel safe, guess what? They're not going to come back and they're not going to depend on us for that food. So, you know, as far as it went in the fast food realm, what we did was we tried to limit the, the interaction in the sense that when they would come through the drive through window, we would not have, we would not hand them anything from our hands. We would put it all on a tray and we would hand it to them. So that way that it kind of limited the, the touching and interaction. So they felt completely self safe. And so in that sense, guests very much appreciated that. In the casual dining spectrum, we did everything we could to go above and beyond to make sure everybody who came in the restaurant felt safe. So we had, you know, team members who were specifically scheduled and designated to just wipe down commonly touched, commonly touched uh, touch points. So that means the handles of the doors that guests come in to touch that, that they use to walk in. That means the bathrooms, the faucets, everything that they touch, even so much that as soon as a table is done and someone is finished with their dining experience, this person will go over, they'll spray the sanitizing um, liquid on the table, on the chairs, everything that around there and just wipe it all down. So, you know, we ourselves are putting our team member in a safe position, but we're also displaying to the guests that, hey, your safety matters as much to you as it does to us. And we're doing everything completely possible to make sure you're comfortable coming in. And so I truly do believe that, you know, putting the guest and team member need first has helped us build our sales week to week because guests are comfortable trusting us coming back out to us. I see. Just a speculative question. Um, yeah. Is there a change in the age dynamics um, of the users which are coming in? I would imagine with the public transportation running, maybe a lot of young folks who don't have a driving permit or a license would be coming in and eating at your dine-ins if that's the kind of food you're serving. But now that only those who own a vehicle can come in, so has it has it changed the age group that's coming to your uh, to your restaurants? Have you seen any change in statistics there? Uh, well, you know, it hasn't changed. You know, as far as you know, like Houston locally, um, we do have a good public transportation system, but that's not truly what a lot of people depend on. But yes, what we have seen is that actually we've seen a little bit of a younger demographic coming into our stores. And we've also seen, and, and that's partly due to a lot of people working from home. Uh, and so they're just, they feel a lot more flexibility as far as going out to eat for, for uh, uh, lunch or going out to eat a little later. And so another thing we've also seen is, uh, we've seen a change in the demographic, but what we've also seen is a change in our peak hours. So generally in the casual dining space, we would have lunch from, you know, uh, we would start seeing a good pickup of lunch from 12 to two. That was our concentration of lunch period. And about three to five was, you know, a slower period in the restaurant. And then we would have, you know, a dinner from seven to about 10. And so what we started to see is this 12 to two lunch period has now transitioned to later. So two to five is now busier than 12 to two. And that's just because people are working from home. People are getting home. People are getting up a little later. They feel more flexibility in their schedule. So now from three to 10, we're seeing a good flow of people rather than these two concentration periods. So it, it's been, it's very interesting to analyze it at week over week to see the different changes that you're going through. It is definitely interesting. So as I, I can give you an experience that when I started staying home, um, I started exploring restaurants that I've never explored before who were in my vicinity. So just like I was reaching out to those restaurants as a first time user, although we were pretty close, I, I imagine that this is something uh, that is probably also replicated in other places where people in the neighborhood who were not very likely to buy this food because they were away at work during that time have also started uh, buying from, from the local shops now because they are at home. Yeah, you're absolutely right with that. What we've started to see is that We've seen a lot of local guests coming in that live close by saying, oh yeah, I just walked over to you guys. I haven't been here in a while because I work in this so-and-so location. I don't get home till later. 
you know, whatever the reason is. And, and we truly value that because those are our neighbors and they're our family that surround us. So it's been really great because another great part of it is that someone who, you know, maybe they came into our restaurant before and they didn't have a good experience or they didn't like the food at that point because of the quality or anything it is, they decide to give us a second chance because we're so close to them. And, you know, of course, we're doing everything we can to make sure that everybody is, you know, we feel honored that they want to share their time with us and they want to share their very carefully selected experience with us. So we're going above and beyond. And what's been really great is, you know, we've been able to get that second chance with them and we've, we feel like we've won them over and now we see them all the time. So you're absolutely right. People are making a community of the surrounding areas. Osman, another area which I think many of our viewers would be interested in is understanding the impact that it is now having on the environment. Because previously we were thinking that there was a lot of efforts which were going on, going plastic free. And if you're getting the customers into the restaurant, then you are not really serving plastic dishes um, and it's easy to uh, wash them. But now all of a sudden uh, our, our moves away from plastic are somewhat challenged because we need to we need these disposable um, materials to give food away so what are you doing in that regard is there any thought process what's happening and how do we with all these requirements yep. still try to stay conscious to the environment yeah so uh, you know with with that like i had mentioned that previously our um, our to go as far as the casual dining spectrum was was not a big portfolio uh, portfolio, uh, part of our um, sales. But so at that point, you know, our to go with the plastic and things of that sort were not that important because we didn't move that volume in it that we had to be very considerate. But now you're correct that with the increase in to go now, we're using all this to go supplies. And you're absolutely right. Now we've started to reconsider and we've talked to our vendors that, hey guys, we can't be using these plastic, you know, to-go boxes and these plastic bags, these plastic forks and things start showing us the environmentally friendly items, you know, that we can use that are, um, that are biodegradable and different things like that so that we can do our part. You know, we're moving so much more of it in volume that we want to make sure that we're not just polluting the world with uh, plastic. And, you know, uh, it, it, what, you know, I don't know if you've seen, but, you know, throughout this coronavirus, COVID, uh, they show, I've seen pictures of all these like national landmarks or, you know, different bodies of water or different um, beautiful places in the world. And you see that because there's no tourists and there's nothing, you know, the, you know, there's not as much production going on. There's been a, um, you know, in, indirect cleanup of the world and it's been very beautiful to see. So we want to make sure that, you know, through this whole experience, we've seen so much of the world grow back that we don't want to, we want to take advantage. We don't want to add to uh, polluting the world. We want to hopefully grow from this area. So we've definitely looked at how can we do our part now to make sure to sustain this beautiful growth of life. So in, the, in this food industry, some of the biggest changes you see coming, which were probably rolled out because of the COVID-19, but would stay because their utility seems um, uh, much more than what we originally would have thought. Yeah, you know, I would say the biggest thing that I think the food industry may have an impact as far as COVID goes is in, uh, you know, fast food and quick service. There was, although 70% of your business came through the drive through you always had this good sized dining room for guests who ever decided to come in. So now I think the thought process has gone to with everything going on and it's being only a hundred percent drive through. It's, it's the thought, do you even need a dining room anymore? How much does that make a difference? Because what we started to see is guests, everyone who used to come in dine in, now they're all coming through the drive through. And with doing that, now you're, you're managing your labor a little bit more closely. You don't have the people who are assigned to the front cash register in the front dining room. So it's a two part thing is thinking that, well, do the guests really actually care as much about the dining room and fast food as you thought before? And then as far as it goes for profitability and you say, well, hmm, with, with no dining room, now you've spent a little bit less on labor. So does that increase in profitability and return on investment 
make more sense by doing drive through only for, for fast food. So I think that'll be something that um, will be interesting to watch going forward is, is dining room, are dining rooms really important in fast food? I mean, only time will tell. I see. And do you think that the food delivery industry is going to see a change or a spike because of that? Well, absolutely. Food delivery has been uh, through the roof during this whole uh, period. And I think that people are becoming more comfortable um, with ordering delivery. And I think, you know, it's a, it's a fine balance because for, for consumers, ordering through delivery is definitely, um, and it's, it's a lot easier. There's no need to step out. You're saving your time. Uh, but at the same time, you're, you're, you're now paying more for a meal that you would uh, more for a meal through a delivery service than you would have paid by dining in because guess what? They've got their own fees and you've tipping the delivery driver. And the last thing is now with so many restaurants experiencing so much delivery and, you know, uh, these delivery companies take a cut of the profits from the restaurant side as well. So with so much being focused on, mm. on delivery, now, now restaurants are considering and saying, well, do we need to raise our prices on delivery platforms more than the dine-in dine experience to make up for that loss in profits? So some restaurants are doing that. And so some guests are now paying a higher premium to do delivery. And obviously, it, during these times, guests are more okay with paying it because they like the ease they like the limiting their interaction but will that continue to sustain again only time will tell but in the restaurant industry everybody knows that you just have to be quick to adapt to whatever the guest wants at that time very interesting response um i think the restaurant industry is going through some very interesting changes and what i have gathered from this conversation is that your ability to constantly analyze and respond is a key to succeed. Otherwise, you risk going out of business completely. Um, oh, absolutely. So, yeah, so understanding, I something... think, the parameters. Yeah. I mean, the restaurant yeah. industry is just an industry that you've got to be able to quickly adapt day by day just to make sure that your guest is always satisfied. Um, yeah. I think the higher education has seen some very interesting changes, and I have learned here that the restaurant industry is also seeing some, some important changes, which might change both user behavior and the services you are providing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's, it's certainly unprecedented in time, especially, you know, higher education. Um, you know, you're so used to that. When I went, you know, I got my master's when I was in college, I always, there was that face-to-face -face interaction. It was, you know, with a student to your right, student to your left, and you guys are all in this. And so, you know, everyone has decided to do it differently, ver whether it's, you know, all virtual, which is a totally different experience or, you know, in person or a blend of both. But I think, you know, not, nothing's perfect, but you get this experience of adaptability, you know, and that'll definitely help you in your future because guess what? Everybody who you, who used to be used to working at a job where you go in, you know, to your desk and you're working next to someone and someone else and collaboratively well guess what now you now you literally you could have been doing that for 30 years and guess what now you're learning to how, how to use a computer and how to use zoom and how to share your desktop and do something totally different so as long as you you know you got a positive mindset and you say well i'm going to overcome anything thrown at me so right, you got that and then you can learn how to adapt absolutely osman it was a pleasure talking to you and understanding some of the things that you were doing. Very um, uh, good to hear your insights. And I think a lot of people back home can also relate to the situation that they are going through and probably have taken some advice on how they can respond to the, to the challenges here. Um, once again, thank you for joining us. It was an absolute pleasure. I wish you a wonderful day. <laughs> that, that's what at your end. Yeah. Um, and thank you very much. Thank you guys so much for having me. I'm so honored to be a part of it. And I very much look forward to seeing the rest of the series and, and learning a little bit more about how everybody's navigating through it. You guys stay safe Thanks. and have a great night, okay? Thanks. Goodbye. Bye-bye.